life. Got David Martin in. First time in ages to make a live donate. Ooh. Right. Good. Okay. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. My name is Colin Way, and today it's all about sci-fi once again. We're gonna make um, a little mobile from our spacecraft that we done last week. Let me just, before we go any further, let me just recap on last week a moment. Um, we've got Ben on the cameras, by the way. He's gonna be asking the questions that you ask him. So feel free, you know what it's like, just write your questions on the on the, um, the speech and uh, he'll then ask me, okay? Most of our videos include quite a lot of questions because we're going over different techniques. Despite the fact that we're trying all those techniques on uh, interesting projects, and let, let's look to last week. So um, I think maybe on the overhead, Ben. Maybe this we're going to start. One, one of my favourites here. This is the old. Um, oh, we'll get him in the shot. Um, hey, well, look at that. The old X-wing. So I'm not going to mention the movies that these come from. These come from because you know them all, of course. Oh, let's go on the main camera, Ben. I'm a bit too close in for the rest of these. So we've got a little Tie Fighter. We've got the X-wing and obviously their foes, but they're fun, and it's all turned. The way you do this is you look at a picture, you, you um, Google spaceships, you look for the um, the ships or the craft that have lots of round circles in them, okay? So things that you think, oh, I can turn that. We add a little bit of plywood and stuff, but easy ships. We're gonna do an easy mobile today. We're gonna to do lots of, lots of these guys, so these are, if you remember again from last week, they're very simple, sort of the old 1930s, 1940s, Buck, Rod, Buck Rogers style spaceship. We're gonna do a few of those. So Ben, could you go to our mobile that we've already got turned? Let me just let me just give him a prod because he's in a weird, he's in a weird um, position there. But well, no, what we've got, we've got a few of our little spaceships, too much of a pod coming. We got a few of our little spaceships. We got a satellite over here. We've got Saturn up there with its rings. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn one of these guys for you. We're going to turn a Saturn, and then we're just going to talk, talk talk about how we get um, everything then put together. We can move our difficult, not difficult. We can move our intricate spacecraft to one side. So. So I'm just having a little problem with the mic, so okay. I'm just going to check a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. What's the sort of problem, Ben? Oh, yeah. um, they're saying it um, sounds like it's on a remote microphone. So I'm just, just double-checking this. I'm good here. Okay, I'm going to carry on demonstrating whilst we try and get that sorted. To start with, like I said, we're going to do one of these guys here. So we're going to do the Buck Rogers style spaceship. Um, we're going to do most of this on the overhead cam, and I've already prepped up some timber. This is a piece of joinery grade pine, so what I would refer to as um, redwood. So you've seen me use this before Christmas time, really, for Christmas tree decorations, Christmas trees, mini Christmas trees, that sort of stuff. It's a really nice timber to work. Um, it's not the same as a joinery grade um, timber. Um, this one is much denser than that. Lovely sort of piney smell. Um, so really, really nice to work. What we're going to do with that is use a nice small tool rest and we're turning between two ring centers. So the ring center I've got here is a friction drive type of ring center. And then we've got our normal um, live tailstock center that side. I haven't been over accurate with centering up. I've just roughly put center in. Okay, um, what I mean by roughly put center in is taking my blank and just guessed where center is rather than being over accurate. You can be, of course, if you want to cut to size, absolutely go for it. So look, the shape that we're trying to recreate in this case is going to be all in one. So on this bigger one, what I've done here is I've done a separate, um, I don't know what you call it, rocket spout. 
um, to, the, to the body. We're going to do it all in one on this piece. Going to make them a lot smaller because this is too big for a mobile. It'd just be too heavy. Um, and the, the string that we use, which just wouldn't take it. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute as well, about the, uh, the type of material we're using to suspend our piece. You, what you don't want to have happen, of course, is halfway through the night, your mobile fall down and wake everybody up. Um, so we've got to be quite careful with that. So lay speed is zero, turn the leg on. We're going to start with a roughing gouge because it's a natural, the natural tool to pick up for us. I'm turning at about 1700 reps with a three quarter roughing gouge. How are we with the sound now, Ben? Are we all right? Um, yeah, I think it's sorted itself out. Lovely. Well done, Ben. Technical uh, guru over there. Could you tap on the mic? Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Good. Right then, so we're roughed down to, set to a near cylinder, and then we're going to clean up with a skew chisel. So let's rough down. For those of you that have only just started turning, you start with your tall handle low, bring the handle up until you get the shaving tomato. We can start low, bring the handle up, there's the shaving, then you're free to move. And the big thing here is just don't start with white knuckles. Nice gentle grip, firm pressure, but not over, you know, not not really, really hard. You don't need to have like that, that fist clench. So nice and gentle, long and The good thing with what we're doing here with all the sensors that we're using is if you make a mistake, for instance, and get a cat to the chisel, what will happen is everything stops. So we call these, or refer to these, safety sensors for that reason. And if you're learning something like the futures, of course, having the piece of timber stop when you get a catch means that that catch is going to be less deep. So much, much better for you. The other thing, what's happening there is the, the ring center has the bed in. So you may, might, you may make several passes and find that the, the uh, piece of timber stops frequently. That just means you just need to tweak the tail stop, tighten up a little bit, and then carry on. Down to cylinder-ish. You don't have to be all the way down the cylinder, but as long as you're nearly there, there's a couple of little flaps. So now what I'm going to do is go to the skew chisel. We're going to clean that shape up. So you know where I'm going to go. Anybody that's a frequent flyer to this um, to this channel, you'll know that oh, my signature skew is going to come out at some point. Yes, Ben, that's the first question. Um, so we're still having a couple of issues with the sound. Um, I've, I've checked it on here, um, but they're saying it sounds a bit distant, that um, they didn't hear the tap on the mic. Um, I mean, I can hear it through here. Um, so some people are saying it sounds fine, and some people are saying it sounds distant. Um, they're not hearing the mic. I'll shout louder then. <laughs> Turn me up a little bit, Ben. I'll okay, and yeah. See if that, that, uh, that helps. Right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to carry on as if everything's fine. Um, so look, we've got the skew chisel. Well, we're about to use the skew chisel. I've just roughed down. That's now generated some big gaps between the corner, or where are the corners, um, and the tool rest. So Ben, if you just go ahead, overhead again a minute. So look, that big gap there. So that's potential for me to get my fingers caught in, so I've got to close that gap. But not only that, I need to raise the tool rest now as well. So I'm going to close the gap first. There we are. I'm pop to number two camera now, Ben. And so we're going to raise the tool rest up at this point. And that means that now I can drop my handle down. I can get a little bit higher on the timber. That means I can throw this point up and out of the way. So less likelihood of that catching. And then we're going to start with the bevel rubbing. I know I don't have a GoPro on this one today. This is not, I didn't intend this to be a skew masterclass, but we're going to raise the handle until the cutting edge makes contact. And then we're going to plane across the edge. Same again, the other way. There we are. So that will give us a really, really nice finish, I'm hoping. Uh, 
we are. This timber helps as well because it's a, a, just a nice timber to use. So what we'll do now is we'll start shaping. So we're going to keep the scoot chisel in hand. I'm going to make the, the little rocket down here. So we're going to do this shape first. And we'll use the, the skew chisel as a, a nice big parting tool. We'll take away some of the diameter. tidied up so we'll do that now and I'll tidy that up even a little bit more in a moment but let's start thinking about the shape of our rocket so the actual high spot on these let me just grab a pencil a bit. the high spot on these isn't here it's about there so we're gonna arc down from there and then down to the nose. Yes, Ben. <coughs> okay, so um, we've got the first question here. Um, what is involved in sharpening the Colwyn Way skews? He has the, the Pro Edge set up. The Pro Edge, to be, I'll be honest with you, I don't you know, use a mechanical sharpening system much at all on these. I'll get, if, if we're starting to lose shape, then I'll go straight to freehand sharpening. You can use, um, you can use the, uh, Tormek uh, skew chisel sharpener, sharpening types with the multi um, multi jig um, that will grip on that taper. But I tend to just go freehand. Um, anything between sort of 25 degrees, no, let's go 20, anything between 20 and 30 degrees, but I tend to aim for about 25. Um, and the better you get, the finer you can go. You can come down to um, 20, 15 if you want to. Um, but most of the time, I've just had a little sharpen before we went on today. I'm using a, a diamond um, sharpening card or diapole like this one. And literally just giving a few wipes every now and again, each side. And that's that's sharp enough. That's absolutely sharp enough. You could even on a scooter, so you could go on this one, definitely. You could go on a, a, a waterstone and oilstone on your bench. Absolutely no problem at all. A couple of wipes, keep it sharp, don't let it go blunt. All right. If you keep it sharp, that means you're not having to change the shape too many times. Enough going over with that, though. You will have to redress once in a blue moon. So literally a re-grind and a re, um, a re sharpen once every now and again on a mechanical sharpening device. Keep it sharp with your, your diamond. Yes, Ben. And a question from John here. Um, he says he's been waxing the lathe bedways for some time, uh, which is OK, but recently brought some of the camellia oil. Um, would it be okay to use on top of the axe machine wax? Yes. Yeah, no problem at all. They, they interact quite well. Um, I tend to use Camellia oil more so than anything else, to be quite honest. Um, it's not like um, a thick oil. It doesn't attract the dust half as much. The other thing with Camellia oil, if you use the, um, oh, Ben, what are the blocks? Garaflex. If you use Garaflex blocks with the Camellia oil, they, again, they work well together. And if you get any... Um, uh, moisture on the bed of the lathe, so any rust that might form, and that can be overnight, for instance. Using them in combination will take it out. It's a nice soft way of taking out any uh, stubborn rust and things like that, rather than, you know, going to power tools and trying to, to sand it off, which is a bit aggressive, I think. And yeah, clearly all is no problem. And then Martin's got a question about the skew. He says he's managed to stop the snagging, um, but sometimes when using it, it whizzes along the project and puts a spiral on the wood. Um, any tips, please? Yeah, so mainly that'll be through beforming, that sort of thing. 
B-forming um, and spiral catches um, when you're B-forming will be because your handle has come too far out um, away from the work. If you think about, if you go over the head a second then, I'm not going to do any B-forming. Um, we're going to roll, in fact, yes, we will roll this edge over. So let's say, for instance, I want to B-roll. Let's up the tool there. Let's say, for instance, I want to B-roll this way. So we're going to use the former, the heel former, do most of the work. So let's do that nice and slowly. There. Now I don't know whether you can see here, look where that steel is. I've got the bevel of my gouge rubbing as I go down through. What happens with a spiral catch means if you bring this still this way, can you see the still moving? If you bring it too far this way, you're actually pivoting the uh, bevel away from the work, that means then you've only got cutting edge in contact. So watch what happens. So I'm going to come away from the heel and I'm going to just use the cutting edge. So here we go, we're going to get a cut. And that will happen all the time. I was bringing the handle further out, pivoting the bevel off. And so you get this telltale and you'll see it a lot this spiral catch that runs up, runs up the piece, okay? The way to avoid that is don't bring the handle too far this way. Keep that bevel running. Don't let that, uh, that pivot off. The way to repair it, of course, is keep the bevel running. Really nice heavy cuts here. Great little practice piece if you if you're just playing with the speed. I'm not going to say too much, but how Christmas tree like does that look? Yes, Ben. Um, so we're just getting lots of suggestions about us swapping mics. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, explain that the, the microphone that I'm using is fixed and Colwyn has a, a remote microphone, so unfortunately we can't swap. Okay, so what I've done here, I've just completely given myself a parting cut. So now I can shape around to that and go over to the corner of the skew. And we would take a little bit more away after we've sanded. So let's pretend that I finished sanding. Um, and I would probably go, you know, this sort of pine is quite a, quite a tricky one. It will show those scratches up quite, for quite a long time, or quite a, way through, a long way through the grades. So I would probably start here with a 150, go to 240, 320, 400, and then stop there. That should be enough. And a mobile like one that I've shown you earlier, generally we would, um, we would paint the figures on that, but of course, you want to keep it. Um, Keep it solid and, and do it just means that you need to make sure that all of your scratches are gone. So there, so with sand, when you finish sanding, then we can go down and take out those nibs as much as we can and just change the centre. So once I've done that, and the reason that I've started with a ring centre is purely because um, a single pointed centre will, will go in far too far. You can see the nib that's left. Now I want to try and get rid of as much of that as possible. So I'll swap that centre out. The ring center and we'll go in with a single pointed um, tail side center <coughs> and now i can take away all that last oh, I like the I'm not really sure. we'll take away that last little bit if we can leave a hole in the bottom it's an engine it's a rocket A little bit at a time, because what you might have to do, if that happens, where the actual centre stops, then we need to just advance that centre on a little bit. There we go. Now, 
Now I'm going to come around to this side. Just pop overhead then for me. And come around to this side. I'm going to do the same here. I'm just going to hold on to this in case it comes off. As far as I dare at this stage, what I don't want to do is, and you can see that, uh, see that little nib there. What I don't want to do is have that tear off and tear a big hole in the top of the rocket. So we're going to go straight to the carbon chisel. I've got a very, very fine, sweet carbon chisel here. Okay, so there's hardly any curve on that. Bit. And then I'm just going to go with the um, concave side of the carving tool up against my rocket and just gently pair around the top. I don't want this to snap away. My fingers are well out of the way. I'm just going to cut some of those fibers so it comes off nicely. Yes, Ben Moss. Um, so a question from Maria. Um, having gotten used to the normal skew over the years, um, would the purchase of the OB1 Colwyn skew involve a whole new learning curve? It probably would, if, I, if I'm honest with you, Maria. The, the reasoning behind the, the, the signature skew is to make um, uh, the transition from no skew to using a skew um, a bit easier. Because what mine does is encourages you to hold the skew lightly. And that's everything with a skew chisel because you need to feel the bevel rubbing. So if you're already using a skew well, don't bother. I'll be honest with you, there's no need. Carry on with what you're doing, it's fine. Isn't broken, don't fix it. Okay, so no, probably not. All right. So look, what I've got there now is we've just got a little nib on the end that I just need to sand away. So I'm going to go to a sanding disc on this one. Okay, just a tiny little nib. We use one of the rotary heads on that. That'll give us a nice finish. Get rid of the skew for a minute. We'll come back out in a moment. So we'll remove that centre. Got our chuck back in. We're going to go with the regular SK114 and the C jaws. You know why I do this. I do this because it can hold my sanding discs, my um, little bobbin sanders, all those sorts of things. Um, and so at the moment we need a small sanding. Um, this let's go for one off of my rotary sander. Okay, so you've seen these before. You've seen me do this before. And I'm going to just hold that in here. And the reason I've got this one and not the big disc is I need a very fine abrasive. So I've got the 400 on here. All right, and all I'm going to do is just clean up, clean up that nib. Because it's 400, there's going to be no show of markings. Just keep it moving. Um, and you're not going to put loads of facets on the end. If you use like a 240 grit or 180, then then you'll, you'll sand facets on there. But a 400 grit is fine enough to get rid of the marks without leaving um, sanding facets. And there we are, that's it. So you'll need to do however many you want to put on your mobile, four, five, six, whatever. Okay, and that would be our first rocket shape done. Okay, we've got to add fins to that. So before we go on and, and turn our satin, let's look how we do that. But again, once again, Ben, if we could go um, overhead just for a minute. So I tend to use ply, and you can use any plywood you want, but um, I have found that, um, that uh, birch ply is the best um, because it's, it's a slightly higher quality. It's not full of voids or anything like that, which your normal building sort of pine uh, plywood can be. And sacrifice one fin, if you're making a bundle, one fin is your template, and then you draw around that for all the others. Once you've drawn around them, you cut them off roughly on the band saw, scroll saw, or hand coping saw. Um, I'm sure, hopefully, you can still see the little pencil lines. We're now going to sander those pencil lines and get them ready to glue onto our, our little spaceship. 
So we're going to start initially with the sanding table, sanding disc that you've seen me do numerous times. So a little kind of disc, my sanding table. There it is. And on the sanding table, remember, I've got my little stop collar set to center height. Yes, Ben. Um, so another question from Maria. Um, she says, thank you for your honest answer. Um, and could you show how to sharpen the 1 16th oddly shaped parting tool? Oh, the curve, with the one with the curve in the front face. I would if I had one. I'll do it next time. I'll do it next Tuesday. Um, I don't have one here with me at the moment, but we'll get one. Um, and yeah, no problem at all. I mean, if it's the one I'm thinking about, you don't you don't actually sharpen the front face, you sharpen the underside. Um, I think I'll have to uh, check on that. Um, but yeah, next week, Maria, promise. And then this from James, um, he's saying he's just rough turned a bowl from a piece of wood that's been uh, laying around outside for a long time. Um, he can see some woodworm in it. Should he discard it or will it be okay to use? Uh, very, very much depends. Depends on the size of the piece. Um, is it woodworm? Is it beetle larvae? Is another thing because once the beetles turn into beetles, once the larvae turn into beetles, then they go. Um, if it's woodworm and in small pieces, you can put it in the microwave. Um, just be warned, it does it does make the microwave smell a little bit. But it does stay there. It's almost like a popcorn machine. They, you hear them pop inside. Um, that's the way to eradicate them in small pieces. Um, or there's lots of um, chemicals you can use to get rid of woodworm. Don't bring it indoors. Um, if it's live woodworm in it, it will go through the rest of your stack. So just be a little bit cautious of it. Um, but yeah, you can get some wonderful effects from um, insect attack on timbers. Um, there's one piece that I remember um, from uh, from the States, uh, which was, um, uh, I think it's on Craft Supplies website, but certainly in the Ray Key um, Beginners Turning uh, book, Source of Inspiration, I think it's called, um, it's a wonderful um, piece that's really heavily attacked by beetle and it's almost like paper beautiful finish but down the ambrosia um, beetle ambrosia maple um, the streaks that you get purely from the, the larvae of the beetle again that's a wonderful effect i understand i don't know whether if i'm right on this but mesa birch I, I, the wonderful figuring that you get from that i think that's caused by beetle larvae and then um, this from Jesse, he's saying, why not double tape um, the pieces together and then cut and sand it all at the same time? We're talking about the fins now, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I see. Yeah, absolutely. If it works for you. The issue is, I'm for me here, because I'm cutting this from one flat piece of uh, plywood, um, I want to sand all of the corners at the same time on one plate. So where would I put the, the tape? That's all. This is really quick. Um, Use your template, pop, 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 cut them out, and then sand them. We're going to turn the extractor on. I'm going to sand now. Nice and slow.
tend to do them separately, so I'll do one, let that dry, second one, let that dry, and then finally the third one. And because it's a five-minute adhesive that we're using, it, it's a quick process. Again, for your mobile, if you're doing several spaceships, you can afford to, you know, do one fin on each of your spaceships, let that dry. By the time you finish the, the last one, you'll be back to the start again. Okay, so it's really, really quite quick. Um, it's a, a, an easy glue to use, 50-50 uh, mix. The one to one. Uh, what is the next shot? Maybe we should make a move. There we are. On the team. So 50 50 mix. Um, it's not as. It's important to get the, the mix right, but it's not like um, a boxy resin casting a boxy resin, for instance, where it has to be really right you know this you can you can put roughly the same amount in um, doesn't have to be exactly the same there we are that's roughly the same amount there you are once you've done that just pick your, your first thing one that i've actually done the on. And this is incredibly strong once it's dry. Oh, I've got the right way. There we go. Give it a good firm press. Once you've done that, leave it up right to dry literally five minutes and it's done okay i'll come back to that in a minute once we've finished our satin I'll put it there carefully just to prove to you that it does take it does dry in that time right we okay for the minute then no questions Are we still are we still coming into problems with our mind? 
we're still having a few issues with sound, so I've just rotated my microphone a bit towards you. Hopefully, that will run. Um, it's going to get me in stereo now. Right, so two mics going. Right, okay. So now let's go to another sensor. I'm going to go to a big Pro Drive. So Pro Drive, so you've got serrations around the outside and you've got that center, center pin. That's going to go in there. I'm going to go back to a ring center in the tail stop. So ring center, the one we use to start with on our spaceship. There we go. Uh, let's find a rough center again. I'm not overly worried about being accurate. We're going to make it round whatever. Now this one, this is um, it's a bit of ingrown bark, but it's really, really quite soft. So I'm going to keep that on the head, on the, the drive side, because the drive side is bigger. Okay, I want I don't want to have a, a single pointed center in there, and um, to then come out because it's all soft around it. So I need a big center on that. Um, I've chosen the timber specifically because it's mottled. It gives that that sort of interesting grain, sort of uh, you know, just to represent the the, uh, the surface of the planet. You know, lots of different colours going on, lots of swirls. Check in the corners, uh, Matt. Miss press lay speed is it really important? I've just gone from turning something about 50 mil diameter to something that's 100, that's double. Um, so lay speed is zero. Turn the lay on and get yourself out of the way. Turn the machine on. Because we all make mistakes. If you don't want to be in the firing line if something goes wrong. So then we're going to turn this. I'm going to turn this around about 1400 reps. And I'm going to turn with the extractor on. This is bone dry. It's got decay in it, sponsor beaches, so it's starting to rot already. Got all that dust is going to come out from that ingrown bark. Um, so dust extraction is going on. What we do is we're going to rough down with this to a cylinder. And then if you've ever turned the speed, you know that its height is the same with it as its width. Here though, we're going to um, have a little ring on it as well. So what I'll do is break that ring first. Go down to the diameter that I want, measure that diameter, and then produce the width. So we, we still stay the same. Okay, yeah, it'll all become clear in a minute. Dust extractor goes on.
Um, so there's lots of talk and lots of uh, suggestions about the sound. Unfortunately, we've tried everything we can um, to, to remedy it. Um, Colin, they're asking, could, um, could you perhaps be able to explain what you've done after the shakta goes off? Um, yeah. I think it's um, the, the sound of your voice is being sounded off uh, by either the machines right. or the, the yeah. shakta. No problem. Okay, so yes, yeah, so what we've done there, just a recap, like I said, width, diameter. So I measured with the calipers, we then transferred that over to the width. So now I can start creating the shape. Um, this is going to be our central satin ring, okay? And the sphere is quite a difficult form to make. So little cuts now, don't take too much off uh, too, um, too quickly. Um, and you just need to keep working it. So watch this. So we're going to take away the corner first. Do not lose your width. So don't go down so far that you get rid of your cut. So every time you get close to it, take a little bit more away. Leave strength in the piece though. You don't want to take so much away that you start to compromise the, the strength. See, we're almost there, we're getting there now. I am going to do some scraping in a minute. Not all timbers will like that. So when I say scrape, I'm going to use the scooches which refine the shape of this um, curve. 
go down again with the parting tool. Both sides. I'm a little bit wary, wary here because of that big bar conclusion that we had, but we need to go a little bit further. Right, we're almost there. I'm going to go to the skew next. So we're going to use the skew on its side. We're going to start just refining. changing hands but sometimes we're forced to so on your left hand just bring that shape around you know I think I think that's it yes Ben um, so uh, a question from Maria um, she says she finds the use of a semicircle template um, very useful. Uh, would you recommend something like that? So yeah, de absolutely. If I'm making um, a balls for for um, uh, patio skittles, for skittle alleys, that sort of stuff, I'll always go with a template. Um, this one's a bit difficult purely because of this satin ring here. Um, but also, we would normally, if I'm doing a ball, we would flip this ninety degrees, so we're turning around, sort of in two, um, in, in sort of two dimensions, sort of thing. So there. Flip it over onto its side with cup centers, and that will take out and create that perfect sphere. And again, just going back to the sound, I just want to explain that I'm not wearing a mic in my clothes. It's um, it's a fixed mic to our um, where we film from, and Colin's uh, microphone is fixed on his head, so we can't actually swap between them. It'll be better for the next time. Now look what I'm doing here. So I'm using the parting tool, but I'm using the side of the parting tool, the side stroke as well. Take me down as far as I can. Be better this way. So you just see I'm using the side of the tool to scrape around. That gives, gets me closer and it gives me a little bit more opportunity to get some definition in. There we are. And at that point, we would take the tool rest away and start sanding. Once again, let's just get rid of some of these tools. Let's explain our next step. One side. So next step, we're going to go with our pull saw. So no, sorry, next step you would sand. And try not to do too much sanding for you. Don't want to be, to watch me um, stand here and sand. But next step after sanding would be using the, the pull saw and just cutting those ends away. Okay, that's going to give us our sphere. Then I can go back to the disc sander and the rotary sander at 400 grit to clean off those little new ends. And that would then be your little satin. You want to make that as round as possible. I don't need to tell you that. You know, it looks better the rounder it is. But you can use colours, you can paint that, you can do whatever with those. So that would be our spaceship. Now let me just have a look. <laughs> so there we are. That's our spaceship that I glued the, the fin on um, earlier. Do you have the main one there, Ben? Okay, I'm holding it by the fin. You can see how quickly that glue dries. And this is going to be suspended. It's not going to be any pressure on these. So that is a really strong glue. However, you know, think what it's used for. It's not going to be a structural piece. So butt jointing is absolutely fine for this sort of thing. All right. Now, if we go back to um, camera number four, then, and our actual finish mobile. So I'm using Dow. Um, I use a lot of Dow for either fixing models together or in this case, we're suspending them. 
some little brass eyes in there as well. Um, it's a little bit of a juggling act to get the balance right, and it's worth sort of mixing up lengths of um, length of dowel, having a couple on one side, counterbalance by repositioning um, your single model on the other side. Just getting them as random as possible. We've gone with spaceships most of them. There's a little satellite um, that you can see there as well. But um, that, in essence, is it. Um, the, the line that we're using to hang them from is a fishing line. Um, if there are any fishermen in there, it's a five pound fishing line. Not that that makes much difference. Obviously, the heavier you go, the, the, the heavier the line, maybe up to a 20 pound line would be, be a little bit better. It doesn't have to be that, that clear and see through. But anything like that to, to suspend them, um, watch really well. So there we go. Um, massive apologies about sound. I don't know what it is. We'll have a good investigation in a minute to make sure it doesn't happen again. We've been doing enough of these lives now um, to think, to expect, to hope that uh, we don't get glitches halfway through or, um, on, on our streams. But, you know, these things happen. So apologies. We'll see you next time, hopefully in good quality sound. So until then, thank you very much. But thanks for stopping by. See you next time.